Okay, thank you so much for being here. I will try to stick to time because I know I'm right before lunch. Um, but I really am honored to be here today and be part of this conference. Um, this project on Imhotep that will eventually be a study of Imhotep, the man, the myth, and the monster, as a lens for exploring Egyptomania in some hopefully novel ways, has grown in part out of my first book project, but in many ways it takes me outside my comfort zone into brand new research territories with new historiographies and into disciplines otherwise fairly unfamiliar to me. So it's with a mix of humility and excitement that I speak with you today about this new project, the deification of Imhotep, which I will preface is very much in its preliminary stages. Um, I'm still figuring things out and I really look forward to your feedback and suggestions. So in my first book, Death, Power, and Apotheosis in Ancient Egypt, the Old and Middle Kingdoms, um, and I actually, on a side note, um, I was told that this was printed. My colleague sent me a text message yesterday that it was printed, so it exists. Um, no longer is it forthcoming, it is printed. Um, but in this book, I explore the social, religious, and political roles of esteemed dead in the Old and Middle Kingdoms. By esteemed dead, I refer to both distinguished and deified dead that are those dead who were venerated, but perhaps not fully deified, or at least the evidence for which doesn't exist, and those dead who were, in my opinion, unequivocally deified as gods. This includes well-known historical figures, um, such as Kagimni, Horjadaf, Hekaib, and Izzi, and in some uh, lesser-known men, such as Mehu, Jedi, and Waka, and I do mean men for this time period, it's all exclusively male. To determine their divine status, I studied quotidian mortuary engagement and identified exceptional cases that diverged from normal engagement with the dead. From this, I developed a framework for identifying esteemed dead in the archeological and textual records. I then looked at how the cults to these esteemed dead, all of whom were members of the elite during life, were operating within socio-political networks of the old and middle kingdoms vis-a-vis -vis the king. From this analysis, two major trends emerged. First, during the Old Kingdom, the king was defining his power through the mortuary sphere. Thus, attempts to subvert or bypass this were similarly existing within the mortuary sphere. So esteemed dead, again, that are both distinguished and deified dead, were being invoked in the later Old Kingdom around dynasties five and six and formulate otherwise previously reserved exclusively for the king or the gods such as the Makuher and Hadeb Dinesut. The cults to Old Kingdom esteemed dead were emerging near the capital very quickly after one's death. And this is because, or so I assert, that these esteemed dead were participating in the same networks of power as the king. And the esteemed dead were alternative means of access for the elite to ensure their posthumous privileges, and in fact challenge the king's centrality in this process and ultimately contribute to the decline of the king's power during the later Old Kingdom. So we can look at an example of this. Um, Kagimni was Chati of the sixth dynasty and his large mastaba at Saqqara was the locus for his deification and worship. This is evinced in part by the presence of later graffiti invoking him as a god and the clustering of tombs around his own like that of the elite around the king's pyramid. The location of Stele invoking his divine cult securely places his deification within the sixth dynasty and more precisely within one generation of his death, illustrating just how quickly at the capital this apotheosis, that is the process of deification, uh, this apotheosis could occur. Though it took a rather modest form, being restricted somewhat by the decorum at the capital. So to reiterate, in the old kingdom, deified dead and esteemed dead are becoming venerated and deified very quickly after one's death. The locus of the cult is in the capital, but the cult itself is a little bit more modest compared to the later examples. So the second trend considers how cults to esteemed dead operated during the first intermediate period and into the Middle Kingdom, as kings are once again reasserting their power and control over Egypt. I was curious to see how they, the kings, uh, might interact with these cults that might otherwise be seen as a threat to royal centrality, especially in the provinces, where broadly understood during the late Old Kingdom and First Intermediate Period, temples are becoming more and more integral as the primary networks for local and regional power. It makes sense then that the cults to deify dead that emerged during this time were not restricted by elite decorum that had persisted in the capital, 
even in a time of the king's declining influence, which allowed these cults to take on more explicit claims of divinity and to be more fully realized. Furthermore, the newly emerging Middle Kingdom Theban kings were themselves originally local nomarchs, who similarly had been tied into the temple during the late first intermediate period as their network of influence. So as power was being articulated in subtly different ways by the kings, so too were the cults to esteemed dead similarly different. But instead of destroying or denying these cults, kings in the Middle Kingdom usurped their monuments and enveloped them into the royal pantheon. This is often evinced by robust uh, royal building campaigns that transformed local shrines to local men into royal shrines that celebrated the king nearly as much as the god that resided inside. Now, the best example of this is, of course, Hekaib. Um, Hekaib's temple has numerous kings building um, in the Middle Kingdom. But instead, I want to talk about Izzy, um, because Izzy is a little bit less cited and a little bit less known. Many DFI dead, like Hekaib, had separate temples built in their honor. But the cults for some of these esteemed dead, such as the case with Izzy, grew around their tomb, but in ways that were clearly distinct from their quotidian mortuary culture, a cult, excuse me. Izzy was a high official at Edfu at the end of the 5th dynasty and beginning of the 6th dynasty. Just like Imhotep, he held the titles of Eripat and Harry Depp. But unlike Imhotep, however, Izzy was also given the title of Chati, either near the end of his life or even possibly posthumously. Izzy is invoked upon numerous Middle Kingdom monuments, 14 times on 10 monuments commissioned by at least six distinct individuals, as a living god, a nature ankh a unique phrase eventually also applied to Imhotep and other deities and transfigured effective dead. In any case, Izzy lived around the same time as Kagimni, but Izzy's deification is not apparent until the 12th dynasty at its earliest. Arguably the provincial locus of Izzy's cult, its formation during the first intermediate period and early Middle Kingdom, enabled it to form in more robust ways, identifying him more readily as a god. There was no immediate need after his death to fill any sort of mortuary void left by the waning influence of the six dynasty kings, since this power structure in the provinces was not as pronounced as it was in the capital. The abandonment of the throne, however, during the first intermediate period may have been a catalyst for alternative structures of mortuary and divine access to develop, such as those centered around the temples. So now we get to Imhotep and how he fits into all of the sort of historical paradigms. Imhotep lived during the reign of King Djoser of Dynasty III, and despite the endurance of his mythos, little is actually securely known about his, the historical man from contemporary sources. Um, and to this point, as I said, um, I'm really just beginning this research, so if you know of other additional sources I should be looking at, I would very much appreciate your feedback. So there's only one extant artifact, uh, there's another Depento, but um, an artifact of which I'm aware that securely dates to the time of Imhotep and explicitly mentions his name. So it's a base of a statue, presumably of King Djoser, but I also wonder if it's not Imhotep himself. Um, and the statue base identifies Imhotep as seal bearer of the king of Lower Egypt, foremost under the king of Upper Egypt, ruler of the Hut'a'a, uh, Iripat, uh, Ma'wer, which is a term for chief priest of Heliopolis, Imhotep, carpenter, bone carver, and then there's two um, sort of obscure titles um, that Vildung reconstructs as the one who works with the spatula and manufacturer of stone vessels. And then to the right of the king's name, who, which is in a Sarek, um, you can see right here, I'll point to it. So sorry if you're, if you're virtual, then you can't see this, but um, right in here. So to the immediate right of the king's name, which is in the Sarek, you can see this other title, Beat Sanui, or perhaps Sanui Beat, if honorific transposition is happening. Um, and this is not really well understood, um, and I haven't found much comparanda for it. Uh, the latter, um, this latter title, Chris Naughton has translated as the king of Lower Egypt, the two brothers, um, indicating Imhotep was a childhood companion to the king, um, or even a royal alter ego to the king. And so again, if you know any more about this, I'd be very interested. Additionally, Imhotep's name is written um, in a depento, so an ink inscription upon a wall of King Sakamhet, Djoser's successor, at Saqqara upon the northern enclosure wall of his mortuary temple. And then finally, other Third Dynasty artifacts identified by Vildung and others have overlapping titles, 
So those two may belong to Imhotep, but his name is not explicitly written on there, and they're just similar titles. So it's a little bit of a little bit of an analytical leap to contribute or to attribute to them to Imhotep. Securely, though, by the end of the Old Kingdom, during the Sixth Dynasty, Imhotep seems to already hold notable fame, with a major travel route sharing his name. Winnie's biography, who we heard a lot about yesterday um, his, at his Aberdeen Mastaba, describes Winnie leading troops, quote, from the northern island of the gate of Imhotep, the district of Horneb Ma'at. So when then did Imhotep's fame extend beyond that a brilliant architect, craftsman, elite member of the king's inner circle, local man of fame to that of a god. So during the Middle Kingdom, um, there is continued evidence for Imhotep's fame, but not explicitly for his deification, though it is my opinion that he was probably already deified at this point, and this is something I'll come back to. Uh, there are important men who share his name, possibly as veneration in theophoric name constructions, um, but most famously, the so-called Harper Song, versions of which invoke Imhotep, may have been written during the Middle Kingdom, though our earliest extant copies date to the New Kingdom. These New Kingdom copies, though, sometimes explicitly claim earlier antecedents and just the, the likelihood of oral culture, at least they probably existed in some oral form before being written down in the New Kingdom. Um, on Papyrus Harris 500, just as an example, Imhotep and Horjeta, with whom he's often coupled, are invoked as the authors, quote, whose sayings are recited whole. So Chris Naughton, um, Barta, and Call, among others, have placed Imhotep's deification in the New Kingdom. Um, and, but none of them mention why or upon which evidence this is explicitly based. And that's not meant to criticize them and throw shade at them. Um, none of their studies really focus on Imhotep or apotheosis explicitly, and he's mentioned sort of in passing or for other means. But I presume that they're relying in part on the evidence presented by Alan here, um, which is to me very convincing. But I, am, I mention this because I'm eager if anybody has any other insights into sort of what evidence they are using, I, I want to know what it was. Um, okay, so... In 1999, in a fest drift, Jim Allen published this stone basin um, that was made based on its inscription by Kam Waset, the fourth son of Ramses II and high priest of Ptah. Kam Waset claimed to have restored numerous old kingdom monuments and buildings, though the historicity of this is still a bit debated. The basin, though notably dates the reign of Ramses II of the 19th dynasty, and so it gives us a pretty secure timeline for thinking about Imhotep's explicit deification. Though the inscription is not entirely legible anymore, um, and it's clear that Imhotep is invoked in several instances, on the right side of the front basin, which would be the viewer's left, Imhotep is identified as Imhotep the Great, son of Ptah. And I, I can see that you can't quite see the line drawing here, but trust me, it's there. Indeed, in several spots on the basin, Imhotep is described as son of Ptah, an epithet that Alan notes was previously typical only of late period and later attestations or invocations of Imhotep's cult. I would also like to add here that I believe this particular iteration of Imhotep as the great or son of Ta refers specifically to his deified form. I mean, this is interesting in thinking about what Dr. Richards was saying yesterday about Edi the great. And so I wonder sort of if this could be an area to explore further. Based on the invocation of Imhotep across the basin, it's likely the basin was used for libation rituals associated with this cult, which we can argue then at this point was a divine cult. Not only is he described as the son of Ta, but he is either, and this is, I actually changed my mind just like 10 minutes ago, um, this morning after hearing a talk. So he's either syncretized with Sokar Osiris, or he stands in parallel to them. So if we look at the same basin on the left rim, it reads, um, Sekar Usar Imhotep, where stop Ta. So the invocation is either, and originally I thought this was in parallel, so Sokar Osiris and Imhotep, the great son of Ta. But after listening to one of the talks this morning that was talking about Pata Sokar Osiris as a sort of tripartite deity with these different sort of utilities, I wonder if Imhotep here as the son of Ta is taking on the Pata sort of variable or position within the Pata Sokar Osiris triad, something to explore. So furthermore, Alan wonders if possibly uh, the reference on the basin's back um, to the living gods of the south, the natural uh, Necheru Anku, and the living goddesses of the south, and then on the front, this isn't depicted, the gods of the south and gods of the west, 
could in fact be invocation of the DFI dead. And this would work really well because Imhotep obviously is a DFI dead. And this then would in indicate that he was deified. Um, in my 2021 book, I explore the phrase Netur Ankh um, as it's a common epithet of the DFI dead Izzy. And in that book, I conclude, and this is a quote for a few lines here from the book, the ancient Egyptian term Ankh refers more to one's social and or religious efficacy than to the beating of one's heart. To reference Pyramid Text 213, upon death, one did not go away dead, but alive. Applying this understanding of Ankh to the phrase Netur Ankh then, the living God was seen as particularly effective and present within social networks of the living. The term is ideal for describing the divinized dead whose humanity was very much alive within the cultural memory of local communities. It also could be a way to emphasize the God in his social role as one who listens to prayers and engages with the living. And that's the end of that quote. And so indeed, Imhotep was uh, also eventually called upon as a living God um, in many inscriptions, but just for example, Ptolemaic one at Hatshepsut's mortuary temple at Deal al-Bahri invokes him as a living God. And the form of this artifact is perhaps um, also worth noting, though I'm careful not to indulge too much in possible anachronism. A Ptolemaic, so much later, basalt statue of Imhotep that's now in the Louvre, shows Imhotep in what becomes a standard scribal pose. He sits on a throne or chair with a papyrus unwrapped in his hands on his lap, wearing a cap similar to the one worn by Ptah. And in this statue, we're lucky enough to be able to read the inscription on the papyrus scroll that's partially opened. May the water from each scribe's bucket or cup uh, be offered as a libation to your Ka Imhotep. Something very similar was quoted in last night's um, keynote speech. So Imhotep's veneration persisted and arguably is best attested in the late and Ptolemaic periods and persisted at least into the third century CE during the era of Roman rule. Um, but this is really the better studied material for Imhotep and he's very clearly deified already at this point. And so I'm actually just going to skip it right now because of time, um, but I'm happy to discuss this in the Q&A or over email or later at the conference. Okay. So I think Imhotep was deified earlier than the New Kingdom. Um, and this is my speculation. I don't have the evidence to back it up yet, but I'll explain why I think this. This fits into the historical trends I talked about earlier at the very beginning of my talk. Um, specifically, I think he was deified either in the Old or Middle Kingdom, and I'll talk about reasons for both. It's apparent from the evidence, his invocation in literary tradition as a great sage, the pseudoepigraphic ascription of an instruction text to him, and the naming of the gates presumably after him, that he held great fame already in the Old Kingdom, similar to other deified dead. Um, that's, you know, for example, Mehu and Kagimni of the Old Kingdom. Unlike Mehu and Kagimni, though, both of whom lived in the sixth dynasty, Imhotep lived and died during a time of strong centralized royal power. So it makes sense then why his veneration may have been more modest during the Old Kingdom and in line with expected decorum, that is until power shifts in the sixth dynasty gave room for alternative means of accessing the favor of the gods and the divine hereafter, and then taking fuller shape in the first intermediate and middle kingdom. The incredible engagement with some of the possible Imhotep Mastaba tombs at Saqqara, such as 3508 and 3518, are also very suggestive. And we went to Saqqara a couple days ago, and unfortunately we did not find his tomb. But I was hoping for, you know, we'd just come across an ostracon. Didn't happen. But around Saqqara tomb 3508, which is the bottom arrow here on the screen, is dates the third dynasty, so the time of Imhotep, Two Ptolemaic area intrusive bull burials were discovered by Emery. In addition to underground maze that Emery refers to as a labyrinth, that is actually a hypogeum with hundreds, if not possibly thousands of ibis mummies. And some of them, and this is the image on the right, are decorated with applique designs of sacred figures of baboons and ibises and Imhotep himself. So this really confirms that this is a place for remembering Imhotep. And the baboons and ibises, because he's associated with Thoth, may also sort of play into that. In his 1965 publication of these finds, Emory felt confident, quote, I think that in all probability we've located the part of the long lost Asclepion and that connected with it, we shall find the tomb of Imhotep. And he was sort of famous for searching for the tomb of Imhotep. The bulls, to explain those, likely connected with the cult of Apis. Emory explains that this was also tied to Imhotep and he describes that, um, he says the cult of the Apis bull was closely connected with Imhotep for when it died, meaning the bull, 
um, its successor was taken to the temple of Imhotep so that it might be touched by the god and thus consecrated. So this is further conjectural evidence that this area may have been home to the original cult of Imhotep, centered first around his tomb, like Izzy, but for whom a later temple we know at Saqqara was built, like Heka'i. So this fully fleshed out divine cult, some evidence for which we just discussed, could be evidence for middle kingdom deification, following historical trends in which the middle kingdom we see cults of deified data more fully formed. But not far from Emory's excavation, a team led by Waseda University in 2012 discovered cut into the wadi a ritual zone used during the time of Imhotep and revived again in the Middle Kingdom. Could this be evidence for the first part of Imhotep's deification in the Old, uh, old Kingdom, perhaps? Notably, the site is defined by large monuments built by none other than Kaam Waset, the fourth son of Ramses II, whose basin provided evidence for Imhotep's deification in the 19th dynasty. This is conjecture that this area was associated with the cult of Imhotep, um, who was perhaps deified upon his death in the Old Kingdom. Um, and during the Old Kingdom, we think that I think this is happening because Kam Waset also claims to have restored a bunch of monuments of sacred importance um, from the Old Kingdom during his time. So this again plays into the idea that this was an important ritual religious site. The robust nature and associated temple building um, at this area is also really suggestive. Perhaps then a middle kingdom dating for Imhotep's apotheosis follows other historical trends, um, as we talked about with the robust sort of temple um, previously, but perhaps even an old kingdom um, deification is possible. The presumed location of his cult at Saqqara um, and would you know, go to suggest um, that this could have been an old kingdom deification. Because as I said, old kingdom apotheosis was happening close to the capital and close to the king's burial. Furthermore, the restoration by Kyle Mwaset um, and later cultic activity here also sort of speaks to this possibility of this sort of old kingdom connection. I would guess that the evidence for the Middle Kingdom or Old Kingdom cult is still to be unearthed below the Sayite and Ptolemaic remains at the site, or it was destroyed in the later constructions. And it's hard to see on this map, but the later hypogeum constructions are truly, truly massive. Securely, though, we can situate his apotheosis in the New Kingdom sometime before during the reign of Ramses II. So some final thoughts. Imhotep is indeed unique. But his life, death, and apotheosis did not exist in a vacuum outside the historical socio-religious networks and structures of power present in ancient Egypt. So while exceptional in the endurance and evolution of his cult and memory, we may better understand his historical influence and deification if we compare him to other deified dead and place him alongside them rather than as a novel case without parallel. And so here on my last slide, I have my bibliography, a QR code that'll take you to the long list. Um, I'll pause here if you want to take a moment to, to find that. Um, you can always email me as well. Um, so I'll give, um, I'll give a pause for one more moment before going on to my very final slide that has my, my many people I need to acknowledge and thank. If I, if I remember correctly, I also snuck in an advertisement for my book in that bibliography with a coupon. Oh, and here's one more. Um, so I, I want to thank, um, it's hard to sort of see this on here, but um, many people at Missouri State University supported my trip here. Um, I also want to sort of really reach out and say thank you to the conference organizers and AUC and everybody involved um, here with this conference as well. Um, and a number of members and RC's staff here were extremely helpful um, in bringing me here, so, and helping me get here. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you so much. Any questions? Thank you for your uh, interesting talk. In your perspective, what are the causes behind venerating, in other words, worshipping such a person like Imhotep? regardless being a great architect or vizier? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and this is the question that was also kind of asked yesterday as well. Like, why? Um, what I can say is that, so I don't know why, but the markers I look for for identifying deified dead in the archaeological and textual records and look for archaeological fame, 
I look for a literary family, and then I look for them being called the dead, having priesthood, dedicated to their cults, theophoric names that invoke them and sort of you know, call upon them as gods. So with that in mind, and a couple other metrics, like Mahler and Kentucky Nessu formulae, and things like that. Um, but thinking about those things, and it's their role in, and I think this is true in general when we talk broadly about the dead. So I, in my book, I talk about this as a spectrum of distinction. You know, so you off on one end and nectar on the other. They're not disconnected from each other. And so why would you have an off of Bern Ross delay? Why Osila? Why would you invoke some dead over the other? And I think it's because they are particularly effective people in life for a variety of reasons. And so in death, they would also be particularly effective. You know, so if you needed something, you would go to the most powerful person you know to get that help. Um, the person that you think could affect the most change. And in that, if, you're, if your need is supernatural in some way, it's illness, it's, you know, health and fertility, but it's not quite something that you need to go, you know, to the king for. It depends on the level. It's something that's pretty close, like something you've seen in letters for dad. Fertility and inheritance is sort of very earthly issues. You might would go to um, an off but if you need an admittance into the hereafter, you would have to go to the king. But what if you live far away from the king? Or what if the king's you know, power, political stance is sort of crumbling or falling apart or transitioning? Then you have these deified dead. And their job is to help you get into the hereafter, um, at least in the individual kingdom, because they're clearly connected with mortuary access through the Mahmoud formula. Um, and why them? Again, I think just because they were particularly effective in whatever sort of way. It could be all of those reasons, right? It could be that one person goes to them because of their architectural literary thing, and somebody else comes to them because of their high position within government and within you know, politics. And somebody else goes to them because their parents went to them and they don't even know why. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily one. I would say it's probably all. Um, and I think. Thinking about ancient Egyptian theology, the more inclusive we can be in thinking of, about framing and multivalence approaches and truths, I think, you know, probably closer to accurate to be more inclusive rather than exclusive of possibilities. Thank you. Other questions? Feel free to email me later if you think of anything. And if you have sources, please email them. <laughs> All right, I guess we will break for lunch then. Let's uh, thank our speakers one last time.